Um, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Joel, chapter 3. This is where we're going to begin. Um, there's a, a portion of Scripture in here that I love because it gives us a picture of what God is doing and desiring to do in the earth right now. How many of you know God has never once stopped moving? We stop along the way and then we find out, and then we begin asking the questions, why are we lost? How do we get out of this mess? It's because we stopped following him. Amen? But God is always on the move. And he loves to pour out. He loves to amaze his people. If there truly is a shock and awe, it's in God. Uh, we talk about that, that war terminology, but really the shock and awe is in your awe and ability to just stand before God with your breath taken. Has God ever walked in the room and took your breath away? There's something about the awestruck nature of God that when, he in, when his presence enters the room, you just go mushy inside. It, 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 is, it, is so, it is so glorious that every knee on earth will bow. Wicked or righteous, every knee will bow at that countenance. Amen. Amen. That's how awesome he is. Lift up your hands and say, Lord, that's how awesome you are. Joel chapter 3, if you're there, say, grant it, Lord. Amen. I'm going to begin with verse 16. It says, the Lord will thunder and roar from Zion. Hallelujah. Zion in the Old Testament, even though we're talking about Israel, is a, is a shadow or a type of the church today. It's a shadow of the people of God. So it says, the Lord will thunder and roar from the church or from the people of God. Mm. Tap yourself on the button and say, there's a roar in here. And it says, and, and he'll utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people and a stronghold to the children of Israel. So shall you know, understand, and realize that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, or dwelling in his church, or dwelling in his people, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and strangers and foreigners shall, not, uh, shall no more pass through it. And in that day, the mountains shall drip with fresh juice of the grape, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the brooks and riverbeds of Judah shall flow with water. And a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shidom. Egypt will be a desolation, and Edom, now Egypt is a type of bondage, it's a type of slavery. So slavery will be a desolation, and Edom will be a desolate wilderness for their violence against the children of Judah. Because they have shed innocent blood in their land, but Judah shall remain and be inhabited forever. And Jerusalem from generation to generation. And then the Lord says, I will cleanse and hold as innocent their blood and avenge it. Blood which I have not cleansed, held innocent and avenged. For the Lord dwells in Zion. I love that beginning where it says the Lord will thunder and roar from Zion. Now, if you're taking notes, I'm going to give you a couple nuggets here to, to think about, to write down. The roar of the church should be in equal proportion to the roar of the Lord. Amen. It is God's desire to roar on this earth through you. Thank you for that two and a half amens there. Hopefully, in a few moments, we'll get more and more saying amen. But it's exactly true. The Lord desires to roar through you, to roar through his people. Amen? Now, I'm going to give you some, some, some types here because we're actually going to talk about the roar of the Lord. But I'm going to kind of weave in and out of what Judah means, what the lion represents, and things like that. So just stay with me for a few moments. The lion is... In Scripture, when, how many of you have ever read the Scripture where it refers to Jesus as the Lion of the tribe of Judah? There is a reason why God refers to His Son as the Lion from the tribe of Judah. How many of you ever studied that out before? Anyone in the house? Well, you're going to find out exactly why God refers to His Son in Scripture as the Lion from the tribe of Judah. Here's why. The Lion represents ferocious. It represents being grand. 
being a conqueror, being one who is to be feared and one who is kingly. If you were to take a snapshot of Jesus for the three and a half years that he ministered on earth, if you were to look at his prayer life, if you were to look at his, uh, his countenance, his personality, his demeanor, his, uh, his ability to witness the word, his ability to be the word, his ability to walk under an open heaven, the purity, the heart that he carried, the, the mercy that he carried, the love and compassion that he carried, and the authority that he carried, all of those things, even facing the cross, had joy. Even facing a, a whirlwind storm had peace. Even when the religious community was biting at his heels, trying to invalidate him, he still had joy. He was still undeterred in his ability to bring the kingdom of God on earth. If you were to take a snapshot of all of those different attributes, if you were to hang them up on the wall and then take a snapshot of the church, you should not see any difference. Don't get quiet on me. We are to be a reflection of who he is. We are called to let the earth see a reflection of who he really is. So, again, we shouldn't see any difference between the, the, the snapshots, spiritually speaking. However, when you bring up the subject matter of the lion, sometimes the, the church tries to reduce that down to a symbol or to a title rather than looking at the realities of what being a lion really represents. It is, it is the nature of God. God said in, in the word that, you know, he left the earth as a lamb, but will return as a lion. And so this is why you're seeing uh, the church that's moving in God in the last days beginning to, to break apart more and more of what that lion nature represents. He is a lamb, absolutely. That mercy and love that the lamb nature carries and, and the ability to forgive sins, all that sacrifice, all of that is wonderful. But there is another nature of Jesus besides just the Jesus on the cross. Are you getting what I'm saying? There is that lion side of him that when he returns to earth, he will show the world the lion nature. And the lion nature is glorious for the people of God, but not so good for the ungodly. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so I want to I talk to you for a moment about, I'm going to give you some 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 understanding of, of what types of attributes of the lion that we're to walk and carry. I remember when, uh, for those of you who are, who are visitors in the house, maybe not know our genesis and our history of how we ended up here. My wife and I, uh, she's always, just, oh, there she is. <laughs> always got to look for her. Where, where'd she go? Um, we were in uh, Israel years ago. We're from uh, not too far south of Chicago, uh, from Illinois. Um, Although you wouldn't know it, say amen. amen. <laughs> Took me 30 years to get here. I ain't leaving. No devil can force me out of Texas. Hallelujah to God. I always say that Texas has got what God's guns and brisket. That's what matters here, and that, that's just wonderful. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. I must be hungry. Uh, anyway, we were. Um, I was in Israel, actually, at the time. Uh, we were missionaries and did evangelistic work and preached revivals and all that. And that's where the Lord, for the, for the first time, spoke that I'm sending you to Houston to plant a church. Never been here before in my life. Never been to Texas. Uh, didn't know anybody down here. But we felt that the Lord was calling us here. And we took a year to pray, fasted a lot, just believed God that he was going to arrange whatever needed to be arranged and open doors and within a year right at the year almost to the date he did we stepped out in faith moved down here not knowing anybody and so after a few months we were here uh in the north part of houston and we were going right down 1960 and looking for a place to live actually and we saw this parking lot and i told my wife i said stop you need to pull in here i need to i need to see this we pulled in and we drove right up to the big white building that's in the corner. And she stopped. I got out. And the moment I hit the step, I hit on my knees, started crying. And the Lord distinctively said, this is where you will plant the flag for me. We agreed to start. And this was wild because I'm about to show you something. We, this parking lot, we, and I looked around. I thought, good God, are you sure, Lord? 
Because at the time, there was a, a club here, the Night Moves Club, which everything you can think of goes on, went on in there. We had four prostitution parlors. Isn't one enough? <laughs> Why do you have to have four for the... They were crazy, isn't it? We had uh, two gaming houses. Uh, and then, well, we, I think we had a, a meth clinic um, that we found out. They were, they were telling everybody, look, we're trying to get people off meth. Come to find out they really weren't. They were keeping them addicted. And had to, they closed that down. But then we discovered that we couldn't figure out why all these bell bonds places. Well, then we realized that, look, when there's sin, there's crime. And so you got to have people on the property to help get them out of jail when they get arrested. I thought, how ridiculous that is. So we were seeing all of this stuff here. And, you know, I kept telling my wife, I said, man, I feel like God is this, you know, even though we got all this mess here, God owns this parking lot. Come to find out, Willie Nelson, the country music star, owned this and lost it all in the bankruptcy. He, he's the one that built it, had it all set up, and then lost it. So we started meeting here once a week where we would just come here and we walk the parking lot and pray. And what was so amazing was, is that when all of that sin was going on here, it was also... Uh, like, a, like a housing area for all the homeless. Because on 1960 and 45, all the homeless would walk down here and this is where they would spend the night. We would come here and they'd be on the sleep on the sidewalks. They'd be up in the, in the white building up on the roof, inside the building, out back. I mean, it was just every week there'd be 20 of them we would see here. And so we started bringing them food. And we started praying with them. And, and I remember this is once a week now we were doing this. We were coming here and praying, walking the parking lot. We had one night where we were all joined in hands praying, and a homeless lady walked up and separated the hands and joined hands and gave her heart to God right there on the spot. We, I mean, we saw, we saw people healed, supernatural healings, miracles. I mean, it was unbelievable what we saw God was doing. And I'll never forget, we were here on a Friday night, and this is, I think, just a few months before we planted. The club was going, and... Uh, this club, if you didn't know, it was there. It was a massive, I think it was a hip-hop club. I don't know what kind of club it was, but uh, the crime that would ensue because of it, we ran a police report. There was like 15 pages of, of assault charges, drug possession, rapes. I mean, everything that you can think of, vandalism, it was all coming from that club. So I'm walking, and they got, this is probably about 9 o'clock at night. They got the speakers out front. The lights lit up, and they're, and they're starting to do their jam and getting everything set up for the parking lot. And I'm walking towards the back. There's like three or four people that are on each side that are walking with us. And I begin to sense like, you know what, Lord? That is a stronghold over this parking lot. We're not even here yet on the property. And I think, God, that's got to go. Right. And I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I just can't coexist with that place open. Exactly. Because you deem it illegal up there. It's got to be illegal here. Amen. And so faith began to come alive in us. And I'll never forget all at one time, me and like two other people, all of a sudden, as we were praying in the spirit, we saw this massive lion begin to walk down the center of the parking lot. I saw it, two other people saw it at the same time, just in the spirit, in the vision of the Lord. And all of a sudden we heard it roar and it just rattled. And I thought, Lord, what in the world is that? And then the Lord began to show me that the roar of the Lord is a war cry. And when the roar of the Lord came, I knew then that God was declaring war on the principalities over this parking lot. When we got on the property, we never forgot that. And we, we started every Friday night when all these young people uh, would, would come here and, and want to go to the club. We had a little tent set up outside. We play praise music and, and we give them free God readings. <laughs> Good God. You say, well, what's a God read? We just sit them down, read them the Psalms. Yeah, we begin right. prophesying over and praying. And it was amazing how many kids that would not come back the next week for the club. <laughs> Didn't it? I mean, it, it, within a few weeks, they went from probably two or 3,000 down to hardly nothing. To the point where the club owner stormed over across the parking lot. And I'm standing there and he goes, what in the world are you doing? Because we hadn't had a sign up or nothing yet. We were just doing remodeling. He said, what are you and who are you? And I said, well, I'm Pastor Rod, first of all. And I said, I'm here to take over the parking lot. Amen. And I kid you not, he started trembling. And he said, what do you mean? I said, we're, we're a church. God's planted us here, and we're about to take the parking lot from you. 
That's pretty bold to say that. But I, this guy is like every ounce of blood drained from his body. He, he, this is what he did. This is how fast. And we were in the corner, right? And this is what he did. It, I bet it took him five minutes to get back to the club. Three weeks later, the club closed. Shoot, sealed it. And then the city sealed it on top of it. The point I'm trying to make is that when the, when the lion roars, the atmosphere changes. The geographics change. Amen? Say amen, somebody. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you just quickly a couple things of what the roar represents. All right? The first thing, if you're taking notes, write this down. The roar represents a call to praise. A call to praise. I know we talked about the parking lot here and the vision here, but how many of you have a vision that God has given you? How many of you got a promise that God has spoken over you? You carry inside an inheritance from that vision. Do you understand? This house has inheritance on this parking lot. Our job is to seize it. It's the enemy's job to try to take it or try to possess it. It's the same with us personally, that if you have a promise that you're carrying, you're going to have to take it from the hands of the enemy. Because the devil's not going to see that, that's the glory side, and just say, I, I've got too much glory, here you go, take it. He's going to want to seize it. He's going to want to lay hold of it. And so when you in your life begin to start warring for that vision, and you will if you haven't already, because you can't, you can't live 30 years in God tuning a deaf ear to what you've been called to do. Talk to me, somebody. At some point, God will get in your ear, and even if you got headphones in, he'll pull, he'll pull them out and begin to thunder in your ear, what are you doing about my vision? What are you doing about the giftings that I've put in you? What are you doing about the people and the things that I've called you to do? What are you doing right now to see that come to pay? I'm telling you, if you haven't already, you will come to that moment. And when he speaks it, the good news is, is that when it begins to take shape, the, you'll begin to hear the roars. And the very first thing that he roars is the call to praise. If you look at, you know, just for the sake of time, write this down. Judges 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, who shall be first to go up for us against the Canaanites? The Canaanite people had been occupying the promise. You understand what's happening here? And so now all of Israel surrounded the, 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 the encampment, and they're saying, Who, what, what tribe are we sending first, Lord? Who's going to go in first to the battle? Who's going to be that first initial attack? And God says, hold up, don't move. I'm sending in my tribe called Judah. And Judah, you know what it means in Hebrews? Praise. Judah means praise. Isn't that amazing that before God launches one bomb, before God brings the shock and awe, he'll send in the praise. How many of you like to praise God? There is something definitive that will happen in your life when you get close to your promise. You'll be a praise monster. You'll be a walk in praise service. You'll be standing in line at Starbucks and somebody will hear a song service going on, don't even know where it's coming from. It'll be coming from you. You'll be carrying a praise service within you. See, praise is not a worship. It's not a song service, as my wife said. I love this quote. It's a, it's a condition of the heart. You, you may not have one instrument playing, but the praise is emanating from your heart. And, when, and the very first thing God will flood the battlefield with is praise. And there's a reason why. Because when God hears praise, the Bible says, I'm feeling the, a, such a precious anointing. Hallelujah. we got to stop and have a commercial right here. Let, let's, let's all stand for just a moment. Hallelujah to God. Let, give God some praise. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yeah, give him some praise. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know what, praise, you can be seated, hallelujah. I love those spontaneous bursts of glory, hallelujah. Do you know what praise does? Praise, the Bible says, draws God to inhabit. 
The word inhabit means to consume. It means to possess. I guarantee you, if you set in your heart a purpose to, to let's say, take Monday afternoons for praise, God, you will, you will walk through the threshold of the glory because God will be there ready to consume it. That's why God wants the battlefield consumed. Because when he consumes, there's no occupation except him. Amen? So that's good preaching, Pastor. Hallelujah. Mm. Now, the thing that I want to share with you about praise is that there's, there's something keen about God and why he sends praise in and why it signifies a roar. Did you know God has never fought a battle that he hasn't won? And did you know that God has never sought out to fight a battle that he hadn't already won? See, the Bible says that he'll establish the, the, the ending at the beginning. That means that every battle needs to be fought has already been laid out. That way, when God steps on the battlefield, he don't have to do nothing. It's already been won. See, it's strategic with God. Victory comes by, by strategy, not by chance. Jesus didn't win by luck. He didn't drop a coin. And say, Let's hope I win some quarters. It was strategic with him. And the moment he stepped on the battle, the victory was already his. So the roar represents praise. Stay with me. But it also represents something else. Are you ready for this? It means to clear the air. The word roar means to clear the air. The reason Jesus is referred to as a lion is because of his kingship. And you what the word, when you look at the definition of roar, you'll see clear air or to clear air. Why would, why would a roar of the lion need to clear the air? Because that word roar literally means to make way for the king. And I'm telling you, as God's people, when you hear the roar of the lion, you better know the king is on his way. Keep your eyes on the king. Tell the person next to you, keep your eyes on the king. And the less you keep your eyes on a man, the more clearly you'll be able to see the king. Talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. The lion is also, if you look at just the lion, we've heard this in, in, in just in school and being brought up that the lion was the king of the jungle, right? Well, actually, there's reason why that it's noted that way. Uh, and because the lion, from, from, the, from the animal perspective, literally rules the jungle. He, even though he can be taken out and, and things like that in the natural, that's why they refer to him, a lion, as the king of the jungle. But something that even more wonderful is Jesus is referred as a lion because he is king of all kings. He is king over all. And God's people sometimes forget the kingship of Christ. We want the kingdom and all the wonderful kingdom and uh, 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 treasures that come with it, but you can't forget the king. You wouldn't have a kingdom without a king. Talk to me, somebody. Now, Genesis chapter 14, write this down as a reference, uh, verses 17 through 22. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break open why he's referred to as king for just a moment. In verse 17, it says, After his return from the defeat and slaying of uh, Chattelamer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. Melchizedek, king of Salem, later called Jerusalem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God most high. One translation says El Elyon. And it says, and he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor and maker of heaven and earth, and blessed, praised, and glorified be God most high, who has given your foes into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of all that he had taken. And the king of Sodom had said to Abram, give me the persons and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand and sworn to the Lord, El Elyon, which means in Hebrew, God most high. And it says, 
The God Most High is the possessor and maker of heaven and earth. Now, I'm going to give you some things to, to keep in the forefront because we're, we're so taught to always remember Jesus as Savior. But there's a lot more to Jesus than just him being our Savior. You will not, you will, do you understand you will not spend eternity in heaven as uh, serving Jesus as your Savior. You will spend eternity serving your King. And so we got to be kingdom people to understand how the kingdom works and how to properly serve the king. Amen. Talk to me, somebody. Amen. Now, let me give you some things about the king, kingship of Christ. Jesus was referred to as a lion is because of his kingship, which represents his sovereignty and his majesty. A lion is always referred to as the king overall. It literally means God most high or God supreme means he's untouchable, uncomparable. Nobody can be exalted above him. He has all dominion, all rank, all authority, all superiority. He is king. Him most high means he sits at the highest peak. You can't get any higher. We call him King Jesus because he contains all the providence. What does providence mean? It means, are you ready for this? It means wielding the power to sustain human destiny. The devil can't do that. A corporation can't do that. A preacher can't do that. Only the king can sustain human destiny. And if he can sustain human destiny, that's why the Bible says he has the keys do you understand? You know, we may not know what our future holds, but how many of you know who holds your future? Amen. Amen. Come on now. If you know that God is sovereign, then you must know that he has already won the battle. He doesn't have to assume the throne. You can't vote him out. You can't cancel his his, his position. You can't fire him. You can't demote him. And he doesn't age. He can't even retire. David tried to find his birth date and got confused. And he said, look, I just come to the conclusion that, Lord, you are everlasting to everlasting. Amen. Tell the person next to you, he is sovereign king. This is why the enemy will seek to tempt generation to generation. This is why he wants to reduce the reality of who Jesus is down to just Savior or just folklore or just history. The enemy fears the kingship of Christ. The, and, and what's more, the, the enemy fears the, 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 the authority that has been placed over the local church on earth. Why? Because we should be walking in the same power and in the same authority. Amen? But the amazing thing of, of God is that he is God and he changes not. Come on now. He's the only one that can say, I am that I am. God most high or him being king means that he is almighty. That means he cannot be limited or reduced down to just an action. And if you can't reduce him down to an action, that means that you can't even record all of his deeds. Good God, that's why he told Job, these are just the outer fringes of my workings. You don't even have enough comprehension to see the vastness of your God. Hmm. <laughs> To say that he is king means to say that he is grand, superior, and he roars. Your king roars. 
Every time your king roars, he asks this question in the roar. Are you ready for this? Can you picture me without reducing me? Chew on that for a moment. See, what is God saying? God's saying that there is a realm of his glory that's going to cost us something. There is a realm of his glory that we and I can, you and I can walk in that, will, that, that, that literally is prime real estate. Best place to live is in the glory. Hallelujah. Are you still here? Now let me give you another one, what the, roar, what the word roar means. It means battle cry. Isaiah 42, 13, it says, The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war, and he shall cry and roar, and he shall prevail against his enemies. God roars as he goes into battle. Did you know in the natural, a lion's roar can be heard five miles in the jungle? Why five miles? Because there's five territories that the enemy has sought to steal from the supremacy of God. One is heaven. He said, I will send into heaven one territory. The very throne of God. He says, I'll exalt my throne above the stars of God. That's two. He said, the, the object of worship. He said, I will sit upon the mount of congregation and be worshiped. That's three. And then jurisdiction over creation. He said, I will send above the heights of the clouds of the creator. That's four. And five, he said, I'll be like most high God. So he has sought to steal the territory of authority. And that's why he said, I'll be like God most high. First Peter 5, 8 says that the, the enemy, your enemy, seeks roaring about a, like a lion, seeking those that he may devour. Notice that the lion that represents the enemy is a devouring roar. And usually his roar is a little bit louder than what actually is truth. You can't even believe the devil. And he struck fear into the heart of God's people because when he barks, so many of us run to the hills. But his roar devours. The roar of God gives life. And I got to tell you something, his roar is much, much louder. Tell the person next to you, his roar is louder than the roar of the enemy. Each roar, if that roar carries five miles, just as an example, that means when, when God roars, he is roaring out authority and dominion over those territories. You can't take the creative nature from God. The enemy thought that he could steal heaven. We look what happened. You know, the funny thing, I, I find this humorous. I quote this all the time that look, he gets kicked out of heaven, lands on what is known as earth, and then dupes the world into believing that he's the king of the, of the earth and that he's the ruler of the underworld. Not one time do you see that he's in ownership of anything. Because the Bible says that our king reigns in the heavens and the earth and even below the earth. The enemy of your souls don't even have keys to his own kingdom. What kind of landlord is that? That's funny. The landlord over this property. I just say this. This is funny. <clears throat> The landlord of the property lives in California, and please mark this time on this CD uh, so I can get this deleted. Um, <laughs> I guess you had to be here to hear it, huh? Did you know for like a year, any time he needed to get into a building in any of the units, he would come to me. For some reason, I had the master key. <laughs> Am I right? He would send his building manager, just call Pastor Rod. He's got the master key. Why? I have no idea. I'm the one that says owns this property. That's what he would say. Hallelujah. That's pretty funny to me. <laughs> Glory to God. The landlord don't even have keys to his own property. I love you, George. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
Each part of that territory is a declaration for occupation. The vision and promise that you carry in here has no room for two masters. You can't share your vision with another. The enemy will convince you that what's in you, you can, you can function just to a level, but you also have to live this way. How many of you know that's a lie of the devil? Amen. See, your promise, that's why the roar of the lion is so profound in the jungle. When that roar went forth, talking about natural now, the lion was saying, look, I, I own this jungle. I will not share my sovereignty with any animal. Amen. Jesus is the same. He will not share his glory with anyone. Certainly the devil. Remember that story in Ezekiel when, when uh, the king of, of uh, Tyre, which is a symbolic of the Antichrist and, the, and, the, and Satan, literally took the diadems and sat on the throne in Jerusalem and taunted God. Maybe you don't know the story. You know the story I'm talking about? Genesis 28, I think. And, and it gives us a picture of what the Antichrist and what Satan will do. They'll taunt God. And, they'll, and, he, and this, 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 he literally sits down and crowns himself most high. But the Bible says that when Jesus comes back, one of the first things he's going to do is walk into that throne and take the throne, the crown, the diadems from the enemy. And then it says, I don't even know why I'm going in this direction, but I'm going to go because I'm just going to follow God. Hallelujah. Say amen, pastor, for that. And there's a reason why he has to take the diadems because, and then there's a scripture that we love to, to quote that he will toss the enemy into the lake of fire. And, and, and the Dead Sea and Lake of Fire has a lot of similarities. It's the lowest part of the earth, full of brimstone. Amen. <laughs> Everything flows into it, nothing flows out. So it, eschatology points that as being a, a type of the lake of fire. But it's interesting to me that Jesus would cast him out cast him into a place. And then it says in Isaiah that all the nations of the earth will come to the mount of God to worship, passing by the place where the enemy has been tossed into the fire. And we'll look over at that and say, is this the one that, that, that tormented humanity? Is this the one that tried to convince us as people that he was more powerful than what he was? And it gives us a picture of what really happens when the king shows up. We bow our knee, the enemy gets tossed in the fire. Now, to me, that's a good deal. <laughs> oh, God, we got to have a commercial break right here. Let's all stand on your feet. Let's give God some praise for that one right now. Good God. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> Woo, glory. Hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. I, I, I tell you what, I love him more than I did five minutes ago. <laughs> I love Jesus. Glory to God. <sighs> mm, he takes my breath away, Lord. Thank you. All right, you can, sit, you can be seated. Last one I'm going to give you, and I'm going to wrap this up, is the roar means that I have conquered. Did you know that when a lion roars, that the reason that roar is carried over five miles is it's sent to catch prey. Did you know that if he's after an animal, a lion, that roar will, will be such a profound noise that it, that it causes confusion yeah. into the animal and it traps the prey. They don't know where, what direction it came from. They just know it came. See, the enemy is blinded to the roar of God. And when, the, when God begins to roar over your promise, every faction that has tried to keep you from it will self-destruct. They'll get confused. They won't know who it is, what it is, how to stop it. All they know is they have a thundering foot coming down to crush. Revelation 5, 5 says, I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one seated on the throne. It was written on both sides, fastened with seven seals. And I also saw a powerful angel calling out in a voice like thunder. Is there anyone who can open the scroll who can break its seals? Verse 3 says, there was no one, no one in heaven, no one on earth, no one from the underworld able to break open the scroll and read it. Verse 4 and 5 says, I wept and wept that no one was found able to open the scroll. 
And then one of the elders said, don't weep. Look, behold, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David's tree, has conquered. He alone can open the scroll and can rip through the seven seals. Jesus is king because he has conquered. He has conquered sin. He has conquered sickness. He has conquered death and conquered hell. He is a conquering king. And I'm here to give you a nugget. He cannot be conquered. Therefore, him in you cannot be conquered. Him in you gives you position and posture so that you cannot be taken under. And when he roars, he roars in you so that you will roar out of you. Amen? See, the Bible says that he holds the keys of sickness. He holds the keys of hell and death. Why is that? Because he has conquered that. Do you know what that means to be holding the keys and have conquered death? Good God. We've got to we've got to grab a hold of that that he is not coming back on a rescue mission. When are we going to wake up as a church and, and understand that he is not here, he is not coming back to rescue a broken bride? He is coming back, the Bible says, for a church without spot or wrinkle. A church that is in victory, not a church in defeat. And when we begin to walk this earth roaring like that lion roars, mm, 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 mm. We will be more than conquerors. Amen. Which the Bible says that we are more than conquerors. If we're more than conquerors, that means we don't have to accept sickness. We don't have to accept disease. We don't have to accept sin. You know, there's cities right now across America that are declaring cancer-free zones. God's releasing a re- such a revival atmosphere in some cities where they're seeing a drop in cancer. Wouldn't that be great if we became a city in Houston where there was no more sex trade? Yes. Amen. Imagine your house becoming a sick-free house. You hear people all the time, well, that stuff's going around. I'm not standing in line for it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Why? Because the lion roars against sickness. Stand upon your feet. 